Greetings, Corpse Clubbers, and welcome to another episode of Corpse Club, the official podcast for DailyDead.com. My name is Heather Wixon, and I am one of your co-hosts. And for this week's very special episode, we have got two special guests joining me for this episode. We are going to be speaking with Greg Hale and Eduardo Sanchez as we dig into all the mysteries of Portals, which comes out this Friday. And also in honor of the 20th anniversary of the Blair Witch Project, we thought it'd be fun to kind of talk a little about that. So thank you guys so much for being here and uh, joining me for the show. Cool. Oh, you're welcome. Nice yeah, thank, you. thanks for having us. Well, I really appreciate you guys taking the time. I'm curious, you know, you guys in particular have worked together for decades now. Um, yeah. But for oh, <laughs> too long. Too yeah. long. <laughs> well, I selfishly hope it keeps going for for even longer. But I'm curious, when, when Portals came around, was this something, because I know this was initially, I think, originated from Chris White, if I'm not mistaken. And was that something that like was brought to you guys? Did you know it was sort of in the works? I'm curious how initially this kind of came together and you guys came on board. Well, Chris White, and I'm, it was a while ago. So, um, uh, and I haven't looked at my emails again, but I think Chris White, Chris White and I have been keeping in touch for years now and been trying to do a bunch of things together. And he sent me an email talking about this anthology that he was doing with Brad Miska, I think Brad was already involved. And, you know, we, Greg and I had a great experience with VHS too. Um, so I think, I guess, I mean, I think I just forwarded it to you, right, Greg? And I was like, hey, what do you think of this? Yeah, yeah. It was like Chris's concept. And then, you know, like Ed was saying, we had a we had a really good time doing VHS too with Brad. So I think Brad knew that uh, we were into anthologies and all those pieces uh, fell into place all together. Yeah. Well, I'm curious. What I think is really interesting about this one in particular, we get a lot of like horror anthologies, but I like the idea of a sci-fi anthology. And I, when I was watching it, I was truly really trying to think about like, have I seen sci-fi anthologies before that were sort of connected in this way? And I don't think it, I have. Um, was it curious for you guys to sort of work within? Because like with VHS, it's like it's different stories. And this, it's like they're different stories, but they all have sort of this common theme to them. Um, and I'm curious, from your perspective, was that a unique challenge that like you knew you sort of were playing within the confines of this overall theme? Or, you know, was it just still kind of business as usual, if that makes any sense? Um, yeah, I mean, I, Ed and I were both very excited about the sci-fi aspect. We're both huge sci-fi fans, as you can tell from... Ed's office there. Um, so, yeah, that, the, the chance to tell a different kind of story was super appealing for us. And we actually enjoyed the challenge. Of, I mean, first of all, I thought the, the portals concept, which is originally called the doors concept, I think. we It's a great concept, really cool idea. It's a great starting point for launching off you know, spot for, for what could be lots of different kinds of stories. So I think Ed and I you know, really liked the initial concept but but we also kind of liked the limitations of of telling a story within a world that somebody else had already created yeah yeah and and like like greg said like we love the the idea of this uh, you know that of different stories kind of uh you know with the common kind of antagonist you know as far as like the door the the portals were concerned we thought it was like it was gonna be a real a, a nice you know, opportunity to make different, to tell different stories with kind of the same, uh, you know, like you were saying, under the same theme, you know, but when, you know, and we, so we involved, uh, I think we involved Jamie Nash immediately and then, and then, um, you know, start working out the idea and, uh, and luckily it fit in with all the other, uh, ideas that they had. And, uh, and, you know, and we just kind of moved forward. It was pretty easy once we got the concept of, you know, creatively, it came together pretty quickly. Now you guys, were you, I'm trying to remember from the credits, um, was your segment then, was that written by Liam? Well, I mean, we, we developed the uh, the idea with Chris, but I don't know. what. How did the credits – I haven't actually seen the final – I haven't seen the final cut or, or how they did the credits or anything. Uh, but, but yeah, we developed the idea uh, with Chris White. Gotcha. So you guys – you both worked on the segment for the call center, if I'm not mistaken, if my notes are correct. Yeah, we did call center. And and I know that there's like a weird – again, with the credits thing, like uh, somebody brought this up the other day and I forgot that they had done this. But, uh, you know, Ed and I co-directed – we co-directed the VHS segment. We had co-directed a segment for another anthology on YouTube, 12 Deadly Days of Christmas. 
And then for some reason, uh, DGA got hung up on uh, us co-directing. So they made them divide it into two different segments for some reason. But I really, did notice uh, that, yeah. Yeah, which was, we never really, still don't understand why that's the case, but but we co-directed this segment together, so. Gotcha, okay. So I, what I love about that one in particular, because obviously in the, you're sort of in the throes of everything that's happening around, and yet it's a very intimate set, you know, in terms of, you know, these people in a room basically trapped. Can you talk about the challenges that because you know, you're trying to sort of raise the tensions, yet you're looking at basically one place and yet you're pinging off of all these different performances that have to kind of come together. Like on paper, it probably seems easy, but I think ultimately it seems like it could be really challenging because of, you know, all the different things that you're trying to achieve within that one scene. Yeah. I mean, you know, Greg and I are like, you know, I mean, just, just horror in general is, you know, so it's so conducive to like one location. I mean, you know, that's what everybody's kind of looking for, you know, and I know one room is very much a challenge. And I don't think we've done anything that's in really in one room. But just in general, you know, most of the horror stuff that we've done, you know, most a lot of it is just very contained, whether it's one house or one neighborhood or whatever, or, the, you know, the woods, uh, obviously. Um, but we knew it was going to be a challenge. And but you know, so we this you know, the, the script we kind of uh, had a l delineation points where like at least the look of the room was going to be a little different, you know, so you, and, and I think Greg and I kind of, and I can't even remember Greg, but I think we kind of came up with a plan as far as like the, the first part being mostly on, you know, sticks and mostly, you know, Dolly and stuff like that. And then once the, the, you know, the shit started hitting the fan, we were going to start moving the camera more, getting more frenetic and more into handheld mode. And then Boa, Simon, the, the, the uh, DP was really great at kind of creating these different looks in within the room. Um, you know, there's a, there's a pre-door look and then there's the post-door look when the power is still off and then when the power comes on. Um, you know, there's still these like kind of these emergency lights are still on. There's a lot of lens flare. So, you know, for us, it was just kind of like, you know, we were just really digging in the script and finding, you know, the right characters, the right actors to play the characters. And, you know, and, and, and just kind of trying to keep it fresh right? because, you know, yeah, it is a challenge to stay in one room and, and keep it new. Well, also what I think is great, too, is in a very short amount of time, you guys actually establish characters. Um, which can be a huge challenge when you're doing, you know, short films, anthology stories and stuff like that. Can you talk about that? Because, I mean, the thing is, within a few minutes, like we kind of already get a sense of who these people are. You know, it's it seems like it's such a huge thing to try to achieve versus when you have 90 minutes to kind of settle in with characters and sort of follow them on this journey. Like this is a very much a one two like sort of gut punch thing that you guys are trying to achieve. And you do it really well here. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I think that's, uh, you know, in the script and the way we tell the story to some degree. But but I really think it's mostly uh, actors. Uh, we were really lucky. We, you know, we were able to talk Paul and uh, Gretchen and Keith, which are all actors that we had worked with in the past. We invited them to to play roles and got really lucky that they were all available. And then the other uh, people that we cast, uh, actors that we didn't know. I think just brought so much to the roles that, you know, they kind of established themselves really clearly as individual characters with their own motivations and stuff right from the get go, just from the, the strength of their performances. So and give a lot to the actors on that front, for sure. Absolutely. I, I, I will say Keith was one of my favorites. Uh, he's, in this. he's so good. Yeah. He's so good. He's so good. Yeah. Yeah, he, he, he really always delivers and and gives you something to chew on in terms of like what's going on with him in any given scene is it's great absolutely so i'm curious did you guys i mean because i know you know this was a concept that was you know overall you know already in the works and stuff but did you know how your segment would play into the other elements of the movie because i also think their structure for portals is a lot different than we've seen from some other films of this nature and i think it really works well and i, I was very surprised um just because i the framing of it was very different because i know the big story with adam uh was sort of the 
the kind of the grounding one that kind of we kept coming back, you know, to that one through this. Did you know like how this would play out versus the other ones or was it, you know, just sort of like everybody was doing their own thing? I'm just curious if you guys had any sense of the other stories and how they would sort of relate to yours. You know, I mean, we kind of leave that up to with Chris and Brad and like the, uh, you know, the more the people that are more involved in the overall anthology, the whole feature film, you know, uh, and we just kind of concentrate on ours and we, you know, trust them. Like, I think they did a, you know, the team that the, you know, the VHS two did a great job of kind of, you know, kind of structuring it properly and kind of keeping the momentum going as, as far as like the order of films and stuff. So we knew pretty early on, right, Greg, that we were going to be the first. Like, yeah. 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 And so, you know, we, we didn't want to like, we just wanted to introduce the portals and then have this little kind of Lord of the Flies kind of craziness going on, you know, just human nature. They're trapped in this room and just, you know, how, how do humans react to this thing? And we knew, you know, we weren't going to take it any further. We didn't want to kind of we didn't want to step on any of the other films. And uh, so we just kind of left that up to them, really. And I think, you know, the, the, the film went through a bunch of different changes as when we started as to like what, you know, what ended up happening, the finished product. And uh, I, but I think they did a, I agree with you. I think they did a great job as far as like, you know, picking the right stories and, and then kind of making it different enough where, you know, where you don't kind of, you don't get bored by going back to, to that, to Adam's story. And also just the order of them, I think is really good. It has a nice little build up, you know? Yeah. But Liam definitely carried the most weight in terms of coming up with a concept that could kind of be broken up and kind of help frame the other segments. You know, Ed, uh, me and Ed's segment and Timo's segment, I think, are more standalone. You know, I think we do, I think Ed and I do a pretty good job of setting it up. And I think Timo does an awesome job of, you know, making the story more complex and moving the story forward. But Liam definitely had to carry more of the weight of coming up with a story that could frame our story as well. Yeah. Absolutely. So you, obviously you guys have been working together for decades now, and I'm just curious, is there something in particular about your working relationship that kind of, you know, you guys are still able to to tag team, you know, after all these years and, and you know, work with each other that there's that doesn't always happen, if that makes any sense. I mean, I don't want to like step on anybody else's toes who've like collaborated before, but, you know, here it is 20 something years later and, you know, you guys are still together doing stuff i mean is there something about that creative relationship that kind of fuels each of you guys like back and forth well we hate each other so much that it really fuels like the creative energy uh <laughs> in, in between us it really <laughs> kind of feeds it. um i don't know what our secret is i mean i just think you know we uh you know speaking from my end you know like i just respect greg's opinion and we kind of balance each other out. You know, he's really good at some things that I'm not great at. And I think I bring a lot of things to the table that he lacks in a little bit. You know, it's just, it's, uh, it is weird that we're the only ones from the original Blair team that are still partners, but, uh, and you know, I don't know what the secret is, but it just seems like we have this, you know, very similar sensibilities. We don't let our, you know, we don't let the ego kind of uh, interfere. We, you know, we keep that always in check as, as much as we can, even though, you know, we always have little flare ups here and there, but it's just natural. And I think, you know, I think we trust each other completely. And I think that's kind of a rare thing uh, in business. You know, even even in the, in the best partnerships, there's always little disagreements when money is, you know, is, is the issue. And luckily for Greg and I, we haven't had, you know, any of those issues. And, and I think trust is the, is the biggest thing that, that, that we share, you know. Absolutely. Is there anything you'd like to add to that, Greg? Or? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, you know, I think it's, you know, a good friendship uh, is, a, is a good place to start. And, and we've kind of, you know, held the friendship as an important piece of it, you know, as, as the years have, have gone by. I think that's a huge part of it. And just the way, you know, what Ed wants to do and what I want to do has kind of just lined up really well. So I think there's been, you know, some kind of, you know, luck to the draw of how we're responding to things. You know, the business has changed a lot. You know, the way we do business has changed a lot over the years in terms of, you know, starting out with five partners and now we're down to two and kind of coming, you know, in and out of a couple of different partners in in between. Uh, and just the way and Ed, Ed and I have chosen to respond to those changes has fortunately just has lined up pretty well. You know, and, and absence makes the heart grow fonder 
to a certain degree because you know Ed lives on the East Coast and I live on the West Coast, so there there is something to be said for we're not always up in each other's you know face all the time. Yeah, and then like when we get together for pitches or sometimes we you know we do little family vacations when we can together, you know it it, fe- it feels special, you know what I mean? And then you know and then once we spend a couple of days together, we're like, all right. It's good that we're going our separate ways. No, I'm not saying, that, but, you know, but, but yeah, I, I think that's right, Greg. The idea, the the fact that we're all, you know, we're kind of independent, but we're still partners, you know. Well, and I think it's interesting too. Speaking of independent, I mean, obviously, you know, 20 years ago, you guys pretty much changed the landscape of horror, which I don't think is any sort of overstatement of of what the Blair Witch did. I mean, it changed the way movies were marketed. It changed what was possible with low budget filmmaking. It basically created a a brand new subgenre of horror. Um, It's remarkable because I was, I was rewatching Blair Witch and then we went into Blair Witch 2016 and I, I hadn't watched the original probably in like three years. And I just, for me, it felt still so vital. Like it just, it felt so different and I was going back and looking at like the different movies that were coming out that year. And one, 99 was an amazing year as a whole uh, for filmmaking. But I think you guys really tapped into something completely different. And I know initially, Eduardo, this was something you had been, you know, you guys had sort of, you and Daniel had been working on this idea of this story. Can you talk about like in terms of bringing Greg into the fold? Like how did you guys initially hook up for that? And did you, I mean, there's no way to anticipate what this film was going to be able to do, but did you realize that, like, if done right, this could potentially tap into something completely new? Yeah, I mean, when when Dan and I, you know, came up with the idea, we were very much inspired by, you know, the show In Search of, you know, from the 70s and, you know, The Legend of Boggy Creek and, like, the the Patterson-Gimlin film, you know, Bigfoot walking across the, the creek bed, you know, like, that to me was, like, the first piece of found footage, you know? And it scared the crap out of us when we were younger, and we came up with this idea, and then we, you know— it, it kind of languished for a while. We were still in school. We were, I was, you know, I think we were both finishing up features and, you know, we were just busy doing other things. And then, and then we came back together in 95 or 96 um, and, you know, to, to try to get it going. And then Greg really was the kind of the shot in the arm that we needed. He came in, he had a little bit of cash and, and mostly he just had, you know, really great, you know, he, you know, we really respected him as a filmmaker, but he had like really great producer chops and he just kind of put it, he started putting things together and uh, we started casting right away. And, um, you know, it, it, it for the first time, it felt like we were actually going to make this movie. And, you know, so so that's how he got involved. And then we, you know, eventually got the money together. We found the cast and Greg came up to Maryland with Dan and me and, you know, a bunch of other people and really was almost like the third director uh, you know, in the film, because the, the shooting of the movie was very much collaborative, you know, not only with the actors, but with, you know, me and Dan and Greg and Ben Rock, the production designer, you know, and Neil, the DP and Tony, the sound recorders. Like there was just a lot of things that were kind of being put into the, you know, into the mix. And Greg was the initial was the guy that came up with the, you know, the idea of like actually leaving the film, the, the actors out there the whole time, which I'm sure the actors loved. Loved him for it. But, you know, we were, we, you know, Dan and I were thinking of, you know, our production plan was more of like, let's leave the actors alone for little bits of time. You know, we, we never thought that we were going to be like, you know, standing over their shoulder while they were shooting scenes. But the idea of leaving them out there the whole time, I think, really took the movie, you know, brought, you know, brought a sense of realism and, and really took the, the movie to the next level. So, Greg, what do you got to say about that, about this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it's interesting uh, because uh, I just watched the movie for the first time in about 20 years. Wow. Friday night. There was a screening here in Portland, uh, and I did a little intro and did a little Q&A after. And uh, it's the first time my kids, I've got a, a 11-year-old son and a 13-year-old daughter, and it was um, the first time my kids had seen the movie. Uh, which is really cool. But it was the first time that I'd watched the movie in about 20 years. I mean, obviously, I watched it a lot 20 years ago (laughs) Uh, and then just kind of never saw a reason to watch it again. But I got to say, and I can kind of say this because I think it's it's mostly, you know, uh, Dan and Ed's work on, you know, really on the editorial side of it. 
and the actors' performances. Again, I think the actors just bring it 100%. I, I, you know, I think their performances are amazing, and I think they never get credit for that. Uh, and I also think uh, that you know, Ed and Dan don't get the credit that they deserve for the edit. Uh, you know, we had 22 hours of footage that we had to narrow down to, you know, I think the final running time is 80 something minutes, 85 minutes, 84 minutes. That amount of work of, from 22 hours of raw, unique takes uh, of, of, of stuff, not multiple takes, 22 hours of, of unique material down to 85 minutes and to tell the story as effectively and efficiently as they tell it. You know, that I kind of got used to that back in the day. But, you know, to watch it again with fresh eyes was like, oh, shit, this is a really well-structured horror film. Like, really, all the horror film beats are there. Uh, and that's really, you know, Ed and Dan's uh, editing. So acting and editing, I don't know. It's, I just enjoyed seeing it, I guess, is the, is, is the thing. I, I really I appreciated the film in a way that I haven't appreciated it in a long, long time because we never knew what we had. I mean, you know, uh, we were surprised at every step of the way, surprised that we got to make it, surprised that we finished it, you know, surprised that you got into Sundance, you know. So I don't think we ever were like, oh, yeah, this is going exactly according to plan, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of the acting, what's interesting to me is I remember seeing it that sneak preview weekend in July 99. Cause I remember it was really hot out and it was back in the day when like you had to sit outside and wait in line to get into your theater and stuff. And I remember sitting on this concrete and it was just muggy out. And I remember being absolutely terrified going home because I lived alone and I lived in like this basement apartment and I spent the whole night staring at the corner of my apartment like oh my god I'm gonna open my eyes and Mike's gonna be standing in my corner <laughs> um and I it's interesting because I you know as a kid or not a kid but like as a 20 something year old like the movie scared me and it really unnerved me and it and I think a lot of people had that response and yet as an like sort of a much older adult now I'm watching it and it really, there's something I, I relate, I mean, beyond the fact that her name is Heather, um, I really relate to Heather in this movie because ultimately this whole movie, like, she's just kind of being, like, going back and forth between these two guys who for a lot of the movie are just doing nothing but sort of second guessing her. Um, and yeah. I really, and I think the movie works well because of her passion and the things, you know, that her quote unquote character, you know, is being driven by. And I just, for me, it was so, I was like, oh my God, like this poor woman, like this whole time, these guys are just basically yelling at her. And I was like, oh, I just wanted to give her a hug. Like after I think it was done, I was like, she just wanted to make her movie. And these guys are just stepping like all over it. And Mike's losing the map. And it was just like, oh, this poor girl. Um, and I'm curious, like, did you guys realize like the the gender dynamics of this are really interesting. And I don't think people talked about that at the time because we weren't really looking at films in that way. Do you, do you see sort of how in that way, like maybe this movie, you know, 20 years removed is still very vital and necessary to sort of conversations we're having. Maybe it's just me. Um, no, I, yeah. I, I mean, I think that, you know, for some reason when Dan and I came up with the, the original three characters, it was always going to be, you know, a, a woman and two men. And we always had the idea that the, you know, that the woman was going to be the leader. You know, we just felt that, I don't know if it's because it's the Blair Witch and, you know, the idea that the legend began with, you know, the injustice done to, you know, to a, to a one other woman. But we just felt like, like Heather, you know, what ended up being Heather, because we, you know, we never named them until, uh, you know, until they, we cast them, really. We had names in the, um, but really like bad, just, ba like yeah, 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 just yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of names. Um, so that character was always going to, you know, we always wanted to have, I think, this connection to the source mythology, you know what I mean? Like the idea that, you know, that there's something about, you know, Ellie Kedward, who was the woman that was the original Blair Witch, that some, some, there's some connection between her and our main, you know, protagonist. And so, uh, and then, you know, and then obviously once we got, sh you know, to writing the script, you know, we realized that, you know, first of all, it's like, the, you know, in, in, in every situation when you're shooting a film for no money, which is what they were doing and kind of what we were doing as well, you know, there, there's this kind of a, a, a different dynamic between the, the leader, the director and the crew, you know, because you're working for free. So there's a certain amount of like, you know, you have to be a little more, uh, you know, cool with them. And especially being a woman, 
uh, and with two guys, we just thought that that was going to be, you know, a, a really interesting kind of uh, situation. Um, and obviously, they came through in, in you know, in in a, in a you know a great way, a way that we never expected. You know, we didn't we never expected it to be that good. You know, but they really kind of, you know, uh, brought it. And and Heather, when we cast Heather, you know, the main reason I think we cast her was that we saw this like you know, level of like, you know, uh, of commitment, like, you know, this level of like, I'm going to get this done no matter what that, you know, uh, the, you know, the, we are the other actresses that were up for the part, you know, they were all, I think they were all, when we got, once we got to the callbacks, I think we had a lot, a really nice group of, of actresses and actors, but Heather showed this like, almost like crazy, like just, you know, like a, like a zealot kind of energy that the other actresses weren't, um, bringing. And I think that's what made the difference. And that's why we cast Heather's that there was almost like this, like, she, like there was almost like the spirit of Ellie Kedward was, you know, when she was channeling this anger, um, and this drive, you know, for, for, you know, to, for, the, for justice or whatever it was, you know, and, uh, and I think that's, that's the main reason we cast her. She just blew us away in the, in the callbacks. Watching it for the first time, like I said, in, in 20 years, a couple of nights ago, there definitely is some uh, gender politics in there that you look at differently now than you looked at 20 years ago. You know, I think this whole idea of, you know, women being uh, discounted as, you know, shrill or bitchy or whatever, when they're really just trying to get the job done was something that there was a different kind of awareness of in 1999 versus 2019. And I, and I, that really stood out to me watching it this time was, oh yeah, there's, you know, I, I mean, look, here's the thing, you know, ultimately she does get the guys killed. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> uh, you know, right. But she, but she gets herself killed. Too. She gets herself killed too. Right. But so, so you do have to kind of keep it, in, in context of she did put them into a situation, not through any fault of her own, but she is putting them into a situation that kills them, right? So yeah, she's she, responsible. She's she's responsible. But there is, because the guys don't know what's going on any more than she does, there is almost like almost like gaslighting to a certain degree with them, right? Where they're trying to convince her of things that aren't necessarily true some of the time. Although some of the time they're right, right? Like she is saying things that aren't true. Like she's lost and she doesn't admit it, yeah. right? So it's 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 interesting in that none of them are blameless, and you know none of them are necessarily the bad guy in that relationship. But I think it uh, that dynamic, that gender dynamic. But I do think you have to look at it differently now. Then you looked at it 20 years ago. I found that very interesting myself. Yeah, yeah. Well, and also just real quick, like we had a screening also on Friday here in Frederick and uh, Mike Williams, you know, from the movie came and he made a really interesting point about like, you know, the difference between then and now, you know, we're all, you know, they were, Mike, I guess, was in his early 20s at the time. And, you know, you know, he's got, he has a daughter now, he's married, you know, there's a different, you know, we've, we've, we're, we're older now. And he said, you know, that, that, you know, because the word, unfortunately, the word bitch was kind of, you know, used certain times to to uh, describe the perform Heather's performance. Like the whole idea of like a strong woman is is, you know, almost automatically labeled a bitch, you know, for. Right. And he actually kind of said, you know, he kind of made the point that, no, she wasn't a bitch. She was just being, you know, if it was a man doing that, you wouldn't call him a bitch. You know what I mean? Right. You just call him, oh, he's just assertive and strong. And, you know, he's Dedicated. just a leader. And he actually, and Mike said, actually, you know, he, he apologized because I think Mike used that word in some interviews or whatever. And, and he said, you know, I wish I hadn't used that word. But I mean, you know, like I said, like Greg said, it, you know, and you were saying also, Heather, is that the idea that, you know, this is 20 years later, like things have definitely changed. But it is interesting to see this movie and the reaction to Heather's performance back then, because that's the main thing we always heard is that, you know, like, oh, she's being this and being that or what it's just being difficult and it's like well no she's just being a leader you know like we never saw anything and you know even though she was kind of like you know she was just really determined and you know and and you know and like what greg said she did get them killed you know but at the same time she was just trying to get her damn film done you know what i mean so it's, it's interesting that that you bring that up 
Definitely. And I, I think it's also what, what really sort of sells this movie as this experience is the fact that, you know, when you guys were doing this, you know, you were working with, at that time, three unknown talents. And I'm curious, going into this, because obviously then when you guys came to Sundance and then, you know, from there, like there was this... The, the marketing was around these these filmmakers who, quote, unquote, went missing. And I'll be totally honest, I fell for it um, because I remember there was like a special on TV and I was like, oh, my gosh, like what's going on? Like it was it was so convincing. And I'm curious, did you guys know, like going into this, like casting, you know, these three as as your leads? Like, did you know at that time that you guys were going to sort of take that approach and you know, did it ultimately serve you guys better because you were working with then unknown talents that you could really kind of put them away for a little bit and really sell the the mythology and sort of the mystique of what the Blair Witch Project was? Like we always approach the story as if it was really happening in the real world. So like we did an Esther tape when we were trying to raise money for the movie, when we were thinking that we were going to shoot it like a traditional film and it was going to cost a hell of a lot more money than we ended up spending on it. Uh, even with that investor tape, we kind of took the approach of this was a real thing and the footage really existed and we had the footage and we were going to make a documentary out of the footage. And that's how we scared the shit out of the investors and tried to get them to give us money. It didn't work, but, <laughs> uh, but, it, did, but, it, did, <laughs> but it did convince them that it was real so, and, you know, and then at Sundance, we, you know, we did like the missing uh, persons flyers and all that kind of stuff. So that was always part of the plan. But but definitely part of the plan was not, oh, let's use unknown actors because of that. We just used unknown actors because that was all that we were going to get. I mean, it was, you know, just it was open call, cattle call casting, mostly in New York. You know, so there yeah. was never any discussion of. Uh, you know, getting a known actor. Although I think in general with found footage films, it's tough to pull that off with known actors, yeah. you know, even, even now. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, our whole thing, like what Greg said, is that the, the main thing that we all kind of promised each other, and I don't, we, I don't think we ever, like, actually verbalized it, but the idea that we wanted everything to be feel real, like we didn't want anything in the movie to, like, show that, you know, that it, that it was fake in any way. Like if we had shown, uh, you know, like, like what Greg say, if we had a known actor immediately, you would have been like, oh, that's, you know, Tom Cruise or whatever. You know, not that Tom Cruise. <laughs> did there, which, um, uh, that's a different film. But, uh, you know, so, you know, we, we definitely like everything, you know, we, we thought it really, you know, like, like I think that was like kind of our prime directive is the idea that like we didn't want anything in the movie to, to be you know, an authentic, like even for filmmakers, like we didn't want any like crazy side lighting in the woods or like we wanted everything to be like, okay, yeah, that's how the woods look when you have a light, you know, basically on top of your camera and the same thing with the sound and everything, you know? So, uh, and then, so the actors having unknown actors was just kind of like that, that was the only way to really to do it. And then once we sold the movie to artists and, you know, I, I think, and Greg and I remember talking to Greg and Mike and everybody about this, the idea that like, we didn't want the movie to be a hoax. You know, we didn't want people to, to, to like go in with like a bad attitude of saying, Hey, these guys are trying to fool us or whatever. Like we wanted it to be real enough so that if the audience was into it, they could go into the theater or actually we did or thought they were going to be in the theater that we thought, you know, it was going to be VHS or whatever that when they played it at home, they were going to be like, okay, this is not real, but it feels real. And that's, you know, the, and they, you know, enjoy the ride because of that, you know, because of the, the, you know, the reality of, you know, it feels like a real home movie, you know, of these people disappearing. Uh, and then once artisan got involved, they were like, Oh no, we, you know, we want to market it as real and we want to hide the actors. And, you know, and I, for us, it was like, we, you know, if it was just up to us, I don't think we would have ever done that. But, you know, we were, you know, novice filmmakers. We had just sold our first film and, 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 and the guy, you know, the people at Artisan, you know, John Hageman and Emerit Jones, you know, the marketing department, they really knew the movie. Like they really were like they, they, their marketing ideas were really great. And they, you know, it was a great collaboration between us and, and the studio. Um, so we trusted them and we were like, hey, you know, if you want to do that, that's fine. And and, and the big thing was of Dan and me was, you know, that we could, you know, we weren't going to lie. And we're going to just go on and do the, the basic kind of filmmaker interview, like how you come up with the ID and all that stuff. Um, and they were like, cool with that. They're like, yeah, of course, you know, you can't, you know, you're not going to be lying to reporters and stuff. So, um, you know, it was a nice balancing act. And I think that, yeah, a lot of people obviously came into that first, those first few weeks thinking that, 
it really was real. And I think that, you know, that was a, you know, for those people that, that felt that way, I thought it was, you know, it might, it must've been like a great experience, you know, for, for a lot of them. So, you know, I mean, I don't know, I don't know if I, a great experience, but at least like a real harrowing experience, you know? So, and, you know, and that's what we were set out. We set out to do. We set out to, you know, to make a scary horror film. Definitely. And I think also too, um, you know, we talked about, you know, bringing in Heather and, and Mike and Josh. Um, but yet, you know, beyond the fact that they're responsible in this film as actors, I mean, they're ultimately also basically gathering your footage as well, um, which is like, I mean, that's a big that's a big order for for yeah. a group of actors. I mean, how did you guys did you just sort of give them cameras? Like, what did you guys do to help prepare them for that? Because, I mean, obviously, there's things that you guys know you want as filmmakers, but yet you know, it's ultimately up to them to be able to deliver it, which yeah. is a huge burden, you know, beyond the fact that they also have to be out there acting and doing all these things in front of the camera as well. I mean, it's a really, it's a really tough act that they had to do. And, you yeah. know, I give them so much credit. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll let, and I'll let Greg answer it because he was the one that came up with the system, you know, initially and, you know, came up with a lot of the details of how we did it. But we, you know, when, when we went into the, into the, phase one, which is the stuff in the woods, we were, you know, we were only thinking that we were going to use maybe half an hour of this footage, you know, because it was going to be a base, you know, it was going to be a documentary about the disappearance and the footage was just going to be a part of the movie. You know, like an In Search Of uh, episode. Yeah, it was going to be like a long, you know, like a feature length In Search Of episode. So I think that, and I've, and I've talked this in other interviews recently, like, I think that if we had known that this was going to be the whole movie, I think that there would have been a little more caution as far as like, do we really want to do this? And are we putting way too much trust in, in you know, in the actors? Because, you know, they, they, you know, they're great actors, but are they filmmakers? And, you know, so I think that the fact that we, we were like, look, if, if we only need a half an hour of footage, you know, and then we can kind of, you know, fill it in with the rest of the stuff that we knew that we had, we're going to have more control over with casting and writing and all that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, it was it was a definite leap of faith, but it wasn't that much of a leap of faith because we had this kind of, you know, this uh, net, the safety net that we of the documentary that we could say, all right, we if this doesn't come out great, then we can just use something else and we can make up for it in the in the second phase. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, I mean, huge help that Josh actually had some camera experience. Josh had actually done some camera work and kind of knew how to handle a film camera. So there was a level of comfort with him that was a gigantic advantage. But, you know, ultimately, you know, and everything that Ed said is correct. I think we probably would have approached it differently if we were thinking that we were going to use the footage differently. But but ultimately, you know, what, and one of the things that kind of stood out to me when I was w watching the film again was, you know, a part of what makes it work actually is the camera not catching what you want to be seeing at that time or not hearing what you want to be hearing at that time. And uh, that's a thing that I think, you know, is a flaw in a lot of, you know, found footage movies now is they can't bring themselves to not see exactly what you should be seeing or hearing exactly what you want to hear. Like there's so many lines in Blair Witch that are just pretty important lines that just get completely brushed over because they're just moving on and you don't necessarily hear it. And it kind of makes you lean in and try to figure out what's happening. So I think the fact that it's not perfect and they kind of did fuck up and not catch things and point the camera at the ground or not be looking at a character when they're talking or not catch the little sound bite that you want for that piece of dialogue to come through perfectly is what makes it uh, work really as a found footage film, I think. Absolutely. And I also think, too, um, you mentioned the editing is was so crucial to this. Uh, and I would tell I mean, editing is crucial to every movie. Um, yeah, but I yeah. think in particular, like it really adds to sort of, you know, trying to find these little nuggets of gold. And I'm curious, how hard was that process then because of sort of the way that they ended up shooting it? Like, was it tougher to sort of put all of the things, all these elements together that you were looking for? Or did it almost in your in your mind make it even better because it wasn't polished it wasn't you know initially what you had thought hopefully again that makes sense <laughs> yeah i mean i mean honestly it was as far as like the films that i've edited it was probably the easiest film to edit as far as like you know process like dan and i got into a really great groove where we were kind of like because we because at first we weren't even editing the movie we were just saying hey let's edit this 22 hours down to like three hours 
And then that's what will be the footage, you know, and then so we don't have to worry about all this other footage because, you know, there was a lot of stuff of just them walking through the woods, a lot of, you know, kind of repeat scenes of them yelling, a lot of yelling at each other. And even though there's some great stuff in there, uh, you know, we knew we had to kind of cut it down to a more manageable level. And then once we started getting into that, you know, three hour, two and a half hour range, you know, we just started finding the story. And, and then at the same time, we were shooting phase two, which is all the documentary stuff. And then, but actually, just just the, the the editing of the film itself was pretty, you know, it was pretty smooth. Like I think, you know, Dan, we would take shifts, um, you know, he would edit stuff, and then I would come back and look at what he he was doing. And sometimes we would disagree. I would put, like, if he cut a shot out, I would put it back. I would put it back in sometimes, and he would do the same thing. And then if I really felt like I needed to get rid of that shot, I would cut it out again. And only like if we really kind of disagreed on stuff did we actually talk about, hey, why are you you know, stuck on this shot. I don't think it works. And we would discuss things, but it was really easy until it got to the point of like starting to stick in the phase two stuff. Then it began to be uh, more difficult because we were having a really hard time keeping the momentum of the footage of, in the woods with all these breaks, with all these documentary breaks in between. And for, you know, we tried for for a while to kind of make it work because that was the original, you know, vision of the movie. You know, we were like, you know, we, we have all this great stuff that we've shot and, you know, it's, it, you know, we, 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 we paid, you know, we had the same kind of attention to detail with that stuff that we did with, you know, the, the original footage, like we really spent time researching it and shooting it on 16 millimeter and like aging it and the sound. I mean, we did a, you know, a, a pretty good job as far as like, you know, making it look like a forties new newsreel, like a seventies TV show and all this stuff. And, and that's when the trouble began, you know, like we really kind of, we had a really hard time. I'm sure Greg not, remembers those days of, you know, just Dan and mostly me and Dan kind of butting heads and then butting heads with almost, you know, these guys kind of, cause we, none of us knew what exactly the formula was. And then finally, you know, right before Sundance, we had gotten to the point where it was like, we only had like three or four minutes of, of, you know, the documentary stuff. And then we made the decision. We're like, we have to let the footage run. If we break out of it for a documentary, for any kind of documentary piece, we lose all the momentum. We lose the claustrophobia. It, you know, it just doesn't work. So we were like, okay, we need some kind of like, you know, background information for the audience to to digest a, just before the movie, so that they know kind of what world you know Heather and Mike and Josh were were living in. You know, we're, we're, we were about to see them in, and then right before Sundance. You know, I remember like just the night before we sent the tape off, it was kind of like we made the decision to just scrap all the phase two stuff, which was the documentary stuff, and just let the film play on its own. You know, and I, I still remember that conversation, you know, the, you know, Greg was talking to me and I think Mike was there. I think Dan was out. We had to call him up and kind of, you know, discuss it with him to try to come up with the final decision. But, they, you know, Greg said, you know, there's nothing in this. There's nothing we can do you know, to this movie, like this, these five minutes of documentary stuff is not going to make this movie any more commercially viable than it is right now. I mean, this is an experimental film. Like, cause you know, we were expecting, I mean, we were hoping for big things, but we were hoping, you know, we were just hoping for a video deal, but we weren't expecting this movie to go in the theaters or anything like that. You know, it was just too much of a, a it was, it was too strange a movie. You know what I mean? And that's really so, so to me, I was like, yeah, he's right. Like there's, you know, even these five minutes are not going to make this movie all of a sudden, you know, more acceptable to somebody who's looking for a Friday the 13th or, a, you know, a nightmare on Elm street. You know what I mean? So we took it out, you know, took all the footage out. We, you know, had that, that, that card at the beginning, the found foot, you know, the, the explanation of, of what it was, of what you're about to see. And then we just let the footage roll and, you know, and luckily it worked out for us, but it was actually, I mean, it took a long time to edit, you know, it took, you know, eight months, probably more, you know, 10 months to edit it. But I, at the, but it was fairly easy to kind of, because they, the actors gave us so much, you know what I mean? That it, it was just, it was almost like having like a, like a 22 hour script, you know, like a raw first draft and then being able to like pick out little bits to build your, you know, the story. So, you know, it, it, but the, but once we started the, the, the phase two stuff, it got really difficult. Well, I was going to ask, like, was, you know, obviously going to Sundance um, and being sort of a breakout success from there, I'm guessing at that point you guys were like, wow, we, we, we might have tapped into something special here. But was there a point when you guys realized, like, wow, this thing is going to be way bigger 
than we could have ever expected. Was there, was it the mockumentary response? Was it just, I mean, essentially you guys kind of, you know, became an internet sensation before the internet really was a th- the way that we think of the internet now. Yeah. I mean, there, I think when I first realized that this was going to be, you know, bigger than, than I thought it was going to be was, you know, getting into Sundance was huge. Just, I mean, that, and that's what I'm saying. Like, just getting into Sundance would have been enough <laughs> at yeah. that at, at that point. But the combination of getting into Sundance and also like the way the internet stuff was going with you know John Pearson like being on split screen and and Ed building the website and the people kind of moving over from John's uh, split screen forums to the forum that that uh, Ed had set up on our website. And seeing people's excitement uh, about the film was kind of my first clue that, oh, yeah, this this might actually, you know, people might actually want to watch this. Uh, And then it just, you know, and then it just got insane, like super pretty quickly. (laughs) It just got, you know, it got crazy. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, That that was probably the first hint for me. Yeah. Yeah. um, Yeah. I I think Greg's right. I mean, I think that the 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 split screen. Uh, you know the 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 showing on split screen and the reaction on you know on John Pearson's site, you know, to, you know, I mean, I think for all of us it was like a big surprise. It was just like, holy crap, there's really a, you know a hunger, uh, you know, for this information, you know, and that's when we built the website, and then yeah, and the website really, like Greg said, was you know we were we were pretty broke during that time. Um, like we were doing videos for Planet Hollywood and around right around that time, the, that, that kind of that contract kind of dried out right when we needed it the most. So <laughs> there was a lot of there was a lot of financial stress. And I think the website, at least for me, because I was involved with it, you know, for hours daily and you know, I would I would basically edit and then work on the website. You know, so I had a lot of interaction with the fans. And for me and I think probably for Greg as well and everybody it like kind of energized us. It just gave us like a reason to continue down this road, you know, um, you know, not that we were like starving or whatever, but you know, there was, there was a lot of stress. I mean, I, I always tell people like if Blair Witch hadn't sold, I would have definitely had to declare personal bankruptcy. You know, it was like, I had credit card bills and, and student loans and, um, you know, and, you know, we were, we were kind of putting all our eggs in this Blair Witch basket, you know what I mean? And, uh, and luckily it worked out, but yeah, I think that, I think the internet, the, the website really was the first kind of clue. And then like, one of the guys, Jeff Johnson, one of the early fans, called up the what, – what show was it, Greg, in L.A.? In LA? Yeah, some sort of big L.A. morning radio show. I forget what it was. Yeah, and, and um, they actually spent like 10 or 15 minutes like going through the website on air, and that you know blew us up. I mean you know, yeah. there was so much traffic, and people were like you – know, so that's when we realized, holy crap, this might actually – you know, like Greg said, have some legs, you know? Yeah. I, I, and I think it's, it's still a testament to, you know, cause everybody these days, you know, obviously filmmaking is sort of the doors have opened a bit for, you know, aspiring filmmakers, independent filmmakers in terms of what you can do because technology has advanced so much, Yeah, you know, but I think it's, it's interesting that, you know, 20 years removed, like this movie still, like if you released Blair Witch now, like, it would be a hit because, you know, you didn't need $10 million to make this movie. You guys made it, you know, for a shoestring budget and it's still effective. Like it still works so well. Did you ultimately also realize like that this would end up becoming sort of a template for, you know, a whole new generation of filmmakers? Because I don't think it necessarily gets that credit either in terms of how it really sort of changed the model for what you could do with a horror movie. Like there's been low budget horror movies that have been breakout successes, but like you, what you guys did was just completely, you know, unexpected in, in much bigger ways than I think we'd ever seen before. Yeah. You know, I think we, I think it kind of set the stage for that to some degree. I think what you're saying, Heather is probably more, the more of the reason probably is just the gigantic shift in, technology and access to to the equipment and stuff like that that we were kind of you know a little bit on the forefront of but you know but really nobody followed through on that at least from a found footage horror perspective until paranormal activity well until until cloverfield yeah yeah 
Cloverfield was before, like, like, yeah, like Greg's right, like after Blair Witch. But that's not a low budget film. No, no, absolutely not. Yeah, and then Paranormal Activity kind of almost did exactly the same thing. Like, kind of this was the same phenomenon that 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 happened with us. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, but it just, it, I just, it, you know, and and I think for us, we always kind of looked at like, oh, you can't do another Blair Witch because, you know, lightning in a bottle, or you know, people aren't gonna. Uh, get into it as much uh well, and we thought we thought right away i mean because it because it really was a kind of a gimmick you know we yeah. felt like the, the the technique is perfect for this movie because the story lends itself to right found it's footage. filmmakers and blah blah yeah, blah we, we just thought that like if we came up with another found footage movie you know it would have been like oh they're they're doing the same trick like a kind of a one trick pony you know what i mean and and that's not what you know and and we we were not interested at all but we i remember talking remember greg like we got back from sundance and we were like you could do any kind of movie this way you know you could do a, remember we were talking about maybe doing a road movie or you know something like you know where you kind of plan the events the peak where the actors are going to end up and stuff so there's all these kind of possibilities but for us i, I don't think we ever seriously Talked, thought about actually making another found footage movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because it's not like you, you know, we weren't inspired by, you know, even though Cops was a big influence on how we actually ended up making the film, you know, we weren't inspired to 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 make Cops. You know, Ed and I were both inspired by Star Wars. You know, that's yeah. what we wanted to do. It's like, I want a, I want a cameras on dollies and cranes. and. Yeah, yeah, we, we weren't, yeah, it wasn't like we were like, you know, like we made found footage just as a style that we were going to keep. It was, you know, like we said, I said before, it's like, you know, it was basically because the movie lent itself to that, you know. And then, you know, it took a while. You know, there was definitely found footage movies because the people would send them to us. But not until Cloverfield, like Cloverfield really kind of legitimized it, you know, I think in the eyes of Hollywood. And then, you know, uh, 10 years after Blair Witch, you know, Paranormal Activity came out, you know, and that that one kind of like open, you know, blew it up again. But, you know, for, but for us, there was never and, and this is before like, you know, like like even like we like the Blair Witch sequel, like we never thought we never like even for a second thought that it was going to be found that we were talking about found another found footage movie, like even even with Artisan. Right, Greg? Yeah, like, yeah, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. That we, was you know. we were not we were not interested in making another found footage Blair Witch sequel, you know just wasn't right yeah although ultimately they go back to found footage for Blair Witch 2016 which I mean I I haven't seen book I saw Book of Shadows in theaters um I didn't I, I didn't totally love it um but I haven't revisited it really I, what <laughs> I'm sorry. I know. I just, hey, it's one of those where I'm like, hate, we hate that fucking movie. Oh, I just, I remember just being so <laughs> let down walking out of the theater and I just haven't mustered up the courage to go back and rewatch it again. No, no, to see. no need. Um, yeah, yeah. But I remember um, because I was actually in the crowd um, when Blair Witch 2016 was debuted at um, Comic-Con because oh, at that point, you know, it was just Adam Wingard and Sam and Barrett have teamed up for this movie called The Woods. Um, yeah. And I was like, OK, gotcha. And I just remember sitting in that theater and that first card comes up and I literally almost fell out of my chair. Like I, I and I was with I was by myself. So I was like, I couldn't even like lean over and be like, oh, my God, it's a Blair Witch sequel. <laughs> like I freaked out like internally. I was like, oh, my God, I wanted to like get up and run around and do circles in the theater. I was so excited. <laughs> Um, when, when, when Lionsgate decided like, okay, it's time to go back to this world and revisit it. Like, did they reach out to you guys initially to see if you had any interest in coming back, you know, as the directors or was it just like, it's time to sort of hand this over to the new guard or the new wind guard, if you will. Um, if I yeah. can make a, a, a dad joke there for a second. Um, I'm just curious, like, was that something, how early did you guys know about this? Like I, it's, I love the fact that, you know, in this day and age, when we seem to know everything about every single movie, um, that's coming and that's, you know, that's being made, like there's still surprises to be had. And I think it's perfect that it was a Blair witch movie that was giving us a surprise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, I mean, Lionsgate, look, Lionsgate has been, overall has been, you know, really respectful of the original film and of us as the original filmmakers. You know, we wanted to make uh, a prequel. We always wanted to make a prequel. We always want to make a traditional film. We always want to expand the mythology based on these very specific ideas that we've always had about the mythology. Um, but ultimately, Lionsgate, 
they wanted to do another found footage Blair Witch movie. And like Ed was saying earlier, that's just not something we were ever interested in. We definitely would love to make another Blair Witch movie or a Blair Witch TV series, but it's just not going to be found footage from, from us. So when they approach, and I don't, I don't know exactly how it went down with Adam and Simon getting involved, but, you know, we're friends with Adam and Simon from VHS 2. Right. Um, so it kind of was a little bit of like Adam and Simon coming to us and going, uh, are you guys cool with this? And we were like, yeah, hell yeah, we're cool with this. I mean, because we, we really like those guys uh, personally. Yeah, yeah. And, and, they, and they couldn't have picked two better people yes. to like, yeah, you know, yeah. adapt, you know, and, and continue because you know we even at Sundance like they we could tell they were kind of geeking out on Blair Witch on, uh, on us being there you know like they really love Blair Witch and and you know and, and we loved what they were doing with found footage as well it was such an honor to like be involved in, in VHS too with all those you know they're like the next generation of found footage filmmakers you know um so yeah it was very much like you know, a weird time because we were friends and, but yeah, we, we immediately told him like, man, you know, you guys go off you, you, and do yeah. your thing, man. You guys, I think uh, Lionsgate told us that they were going to, you know, they they were talking to them. And I was like, those, we were like, Greg and I were like, that's, that's a perfect, yeah, perfect yeah. team to do yeah. it. You know? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. And I, I, I still, I mean, for me, the fact that, you know, because Heather was, I mean, obviously I have very, you know, specific reasons maybe why Blair Witch speaks to me just being a Heather. Um, but I think it was just great for me to sort of see her character still living on in a way, you know, almost 20 years later. And I just, for me, like it really, it meant a lot to me. And you could just feel the sort of, it, it had the connection to the original that I think the, the other, the Book of Shadows sequel was missing. Like it was yeah. missing sort of that heart, that desperation, that sort of rawness yeah. Um, and I, I mean, you know, obviously the films were out for a few years, but you know, were you guys really excited by that? Like in terms of the fact that it really did capture that spirit? Yeah. I mean, it, you know, like I think Greg and I both feel, and I think Dan, that feels the same way is that this was the first like real sequel to our movie, you know, cause book of shadows, you know, no matter what you think of it as a film, it kind of existed outside of, of the, of the world that we created. You know what I mean? So we were, and that, that was really the biggest thing that bothered us about it is that, you know, why, why go outside of the world that we created to make a sequel? Why don't you stay in the world, you know, in the, in the mythology that we created, you know? So this, you know, Blair Witch 16 was like the first time that we were like, okay, this is a real sequel. You know, this, this makes sense in the timeline. Like this exists in the same timeline as our movie. You know what I mean? Um, and, you know, and I mean, watching the movie, you know, you, I can't say that I enjoyed it. Like, it, it really is like a freaking nightmare, you know, a roller coaster ride into hell. But I did appreciate, you know, I really liked a lot of the elements they brought to it and, um, you know, a lot of the ideas. And I love how they kind of expanded the, you know, the time stuff. And, you know, they, you know, they just kind of made a, a, a bigger version, a more modern version of our film. And, you know, and, and found footage has has evolved, you know, had evolved so much since the original movie that, you know, it was just like, it's a different movie, but it has, a, like you were saying, it very much has the same energy as our film, you know? Absolutely. So, you know, looking at your guys' career over the last 20 something years now, I mean, what is it that keeps driving you guys in terms of, you know, the stories you want to tell, the things that you want to keep doing um, in this industry? Money. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, I, I think that, you know, uh, Ed and I kind of share similar DNA in terms of like what's motivated us to uh, get into film. I mean, I've wanted to be a filmmaker since I was 11 years old, you know, specifically because of Star Wars. Um, but just the general idea, you know, starting with Star Wars, but all the films throughout my life that have affected me and seeing the way, you know, my kids latch on to movies or just the way, you know, uh, movies uh, affect the culture at large. You know, it's just a super important thing to me. And it's just it's something that's that's I've always wanted to do. And I and honestly, I just can't imagine doing anything else. I'm just very motivated as, you know, a storyteller or, or somebody that that wants to you know, affect people somehow with art that I've had a part in creating and, and film is just the, the medium that excites me the most uh, to, to do that. So still very, very basic motivation for me. Yeah. Yeah. It's still trying, it's still like, you know, the, the getting, trying to get a story out there, trying to get, 
a certain feeling out there or trying to scare people or trying to make people, you know, move people emotionally in one way or another. I mean, right now we're, we're definitely in the last five years, we've been concentrating on television um, because it just seems like it's, you know, there's a bigger market. There also, it seems like the, there's more, there are more open, the television market is more open to more kind of unique ideas. And uh, so, you know, we've mostly been concentrating on that, but, but, you know, we still want to continue to make films whenever we can. And our big thing right now is to get our own TV show going. Um, so that's like the big, uh, you know, the, the big motivating factor for us right now is to have our own show that we can kind of, you know, control to a certain extent and bring the right partners in and people that we've worked with before, whether it's actors or directors or writers into the fold and, you know, just create something cool. But again, like what Greg says, just telling like, you know, just telling cool stories, you know. Absolutely. Well, guys, thank you so much for being a part of this uh, and for joining me on this episode. Um, it was truly a pleasure. Uh, for those of you listening, be sure to check out Portals. It'll be out this weekend. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, I know anthology horror is, as the kids say, hot these days, but I really like this one because it's very different um, than anything I've seen, you know, in sort of this sort of storytelling format. So really, guys, congratulations and also congratulations on 20 years of Blair Witch as well. Yeah, thank you, Heather, so much. Appreciate well, it. Thanks for having us. It was a fun, uh, fun time. Anytime. Call us back anytime. Wow. Wonderful. <laughs> and for those of you listening, if you would like to check out any news reviews or interviews, you can find us over at dailydead.com. Uh, for more information on Corpse Club, please feel free to visit us over at corpseclub.com. And until next time, everybody, stay scary. Um.